This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Logan Larson, Mike Akins, Norm Fazekas, and Marlon Thompson. On this episode of DTNS, we catch you up on the Move It attacks with what you need to know, whether you're a company or a customer, plus a robot mop that can change its own water, and Amazon wants a piece of ESPN. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 25th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Falafel, I'm Sarah Lane. Delicious. And back in the house, your boy, Chris Ashley. <laughs> Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And just to clarify, I am also Tom Merritt when I'm not in Los Angeles. And <laughs> Len is drawing the top tech stories and right. he's in Cleveland. Yes. They're not the top Cleveland yes. tech stories necessarily. Yeah, that's always very confusing. So. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> All right, Chris Ashley, it's good to have you back, man. Falafel. Thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. studio, there's nothing wrong with your studio. That's, That's a delicious yeah. studio right there. That's right. That's this right. is, is going to be a late lunch. Chris Ashley, <laughs> are you a Falafel fan? Uh, I get periodically. Not my 100% go-to, but I'll have one, you know, right. if it's, if it's there. Right. If it's there, I may partake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Nibble. Nibble. Yeah. yeah, just reach reach right through that stream yard window into Sarah's <laughs> studio. Have a bite. Uh, let's start off with the quick hits. AMD announced the $449 RX 7700 XT and $500 7800 XT, both initially coming with a free copy of Starfield. Both cards also average more than 60 frames per second at up to 1440p resolution without upscaling, and AMD claims that the 7800 XT outperforms the $600 RTX 4070. So, you know... You're getting more for less. The designs are larger, taking up 2.5 slots with in a desktop and use up to 265 watts of power. AMD also announced its latest upscaling tech uses FSR3, which will add frame generation, which uses machine learning to create frames for more sophisticated motion smoothing. NVIDIA added this to DLSS 3.0. Speaking of DLSS, there is some chatter out there that AMD's Frank's Axor is not denying that there's something in the contract with the Starfield that prevents it from supporting DLSS. He has somewhat carefully said, quote, if they want to do DLSS, they have AMD's full support, end quote. The new two AMD GPUs and FSR3 will all launch together on September 6th. MSI confirmed that the recent spate of blue screens of death, uh, you pluralize that like attorneys general, I guess, blue screens of death. Anyway, if you're getting a blue screen of death because you installed this week's Windows 11 preview update, it's probably because you have an MSI 600 or 700 series motherboard. MSI wrote, both MSI and Microsoft are aware of the unsupported processor error and have begun investigating the root cause. Now, MSI basically warns its users, if you haven't installed this preview, which you don't need to, uh, don't uh, until they get an update. If you have already, they've got instructions on how you can roll back the BIOS and then uninstall the update. However, Microsoft notes that some users may experience Windows automatically uninstalling the updates on its own after experiencing experiencing a blue screen of death, which is kind of a cool thing. And several users have confirmed that that indeed has happened to them. Cool. The U.S. view on cryptocurrency, a little clearer today, although it's not going to make everybody very happy. The U.S. Treasury Department proposed new rules on Friday to make it harder to avoid income taxes if you're selling digital assets but also to simplify those taxes. The proposed rules would have exchanges, such as Coinbase, deal with the IRS in a manner similar to a broker who handles stocks or mutual funds. So starting in 2026, exchanges would send 1099s to taxpayers and also the IRS reporting how much customers paid for assets versus how much they were sold for. Federal taxes would be assessed up to 23.8%. That's a lot. Yep. Scientists at King's College London tested eight popular pedestrian detection systems used by autonomous cars. Uh, they used more than 8,000 images of pedestrians in the tests. Uh, so they were using images, not, not real-life situations. They found that pedestrian detection accuracy was 20% higher for adults 
than it was for children. And it was also 7.5% more accurate for light-skinned pedestrians than dark-skinned pedestrians. The accuracy in both cases dropped under low contrast and low brightness tests. Paper has been published as a preprint. It has not been peer-reviewed, but you can find it at archive.org with an X, that archive. Alibaba launched two new artificial intelligence models, QWEN, that's Q-W-E-N, uh, VL, and QN VL Chat, designed to make sense of images and also carry out more complex conversations. QN VL can respond to open-ended queries based on images and then generate picture captions. QN VL Chat handles more complex interaction, such as comparing multiple image inputs and then answering multiple rounds of questions. Alibaba's new models will be open source and invites researchers, academics, and companies worldwide to create their own AI apps without needing to train their own systems. All right. Everybody wants a little piece of ESPN, apparently, uh, these days. What, what's been going on, Sarah? Well, so Disney's Bob Iger, uh, head of Disney, uh, he, he's a talker. He says a lot of things. Uh, he raised a few eyebrows recently when he said that the company was looking for strategic partners for ESPN, since that's often sort of code for we want to sell it or sell a part of this property. But it appears what he wants to do is keep ESPN, but sell off or at least contract out part of the distribution business, especially broadcast and cable, because neither of those are growing. He's also said Disney's been working on a streaming only version of the full ESPN experience. Now, if you're confused, you w probably aren't alone. ESPN Plus exists. It's a streaming service, but it only gives you broadcasts that aren't on ESPN's cable channels. So this would be different. All right. All of that is background to the information reporting that Amazon is in talks with Disney to team up on the ESPN streaming service. Uh, and Amazon might even buy a 30% minority stake in ESPN. If you don't know, Disney actually only owns 80% of ESPN. Hearst owns the other 20%. So it wouldn't be unprecedented for a minority stake to be sold. Uh, and of course, if they were to team up in any way, ESPN's streaming service would be offered through Prime Video uh, once they get that full ESPN streaming service. Sources say the price on ESPN on its own would be expensive, somewhere between $20 and $35 a month. Most of this is not surprising. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Verizon, and T-Mobile are all rumored to be in talks about ESPN in some way or another. Uh, and Disney would like to distribute an ESPN streaming service as widely as possible. Uh, in fact, Wedbush securities analyst Dan Ives is convinced Disney's going to sell ESPN, not to Amazon, though, but to Apple. Uh, so the, it is now the hot commodity. What's going to happen with ESPN? Is Disney going to sell some of it, all of it, part of it, none of it? Chris, what are your ideas about ESPN's future? Well, I could see them selling all of it, but overall, I, I find this to be totally silly uh, on the part of Amazon and the rest of these companies, for that matter. And the reason why is, you know, new media is really stepping up. I mean, I haven't watched ESPN in probably the better part of five years. I just don't. I, I don't like anything about them anymore. And, uh, you know, Pat, they, they fired, what, 10, 15 hosts just over the last uh, two months. Then they bring in Pat McAfee for $80 million. Um, and how did Pat McAfee get popular? By his new media show that they bought into. They could have got Shannon Sharp. They could have got the uh, the two uh, cats from uh, that do the basketball one. They, they mm -hmm. should have used this as an opportunity to build up or invest in an, in the new media style because all of these shows and all these former athletes are super popular and they could have brought a bunch of them together and made their own little ESPN, if they will. Why are they buying into this? I, I don't understand. But I mean, I mean, Chris, you say you don't really like ESPN anymore, and I, I get your points. At the same time, it's like there is only one sports center. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I watch that thing all the time. It's it's this is a this is a very valuable product. Uh, yeah, I, I, I say, uh, yeah, I can definitely see that, uh, you know, ESPN and Sports Center, the name of it, uh, you know, definitely has some value to it. But if you're spending all this money, I, I would assume you'd be looking to look towards the future. And how long is ESPN and Sports Center going to be valuable versus what is worth to them today? Yeah, when there yeah. is a game you want to watch and it's on ESPN, Chris, what do you do? 
I, I don't watch it. <laughs> Seriously? On, For really? real? I'm being really? dead serious. I, I rarely, I don't watch a lot of football anymore. In fact, I was just talking about on the show, uh, uh, SMR this week, how I had to repurchase Hulu live. So my wife could watch, uh, NFL because I stopped watching it as much. Uh, and it, it just, I just don't really watch ESPN. I don't watch a lot of, uh, sports anymore. Ah, uh, okay. 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 And, then, and, but I do listen to, I watch clips on YouTube. No doubt about it. I watch mm-hmm. highlights. I love boxing highlights. I love, I even lost, I still love football highlights. Watching the whole game, not as appealing, even though the commanders did reach out to me to get season tickets again. <laughs> but uh, I don't understand. Like, to me, this is a perfect opportunity because ESPN is definitely losing viewers. This is the perfect opportunity to take advantage of where people are shifting their attention to. So. My point was going to be, and I think it still is, uh, that the valuable stuff on ESPN is the sports, the sports itself, the games. And I think that's what Iger is seeing is like, we will have, we have the games, we have the NBA, we have the NHL, uh, we have major league baseball, we have Monday night football, like that's the valuable part. And how do we capitalize on that? Granted, Sarah, you're absolutely right. Sports Center is also incredibly valuable. It's, it's it's a heritage brand and everything, but all of the rest of it is kind of is kind of interchangeable. And so the streaming service value is I could pay twenty dollars, thirty five dollars a month and get all those games. ESPN has the rights to a lot of the best sports on television, and I feel like that's what's important about it. Uh, on the other hand. Chris, you're not alone in being a someone who just is like, oh no, I, I watch sports by watching the highlights yeah. uh, on YouTube later. And I, mean, I think they need to take that into account. Let's all be honest. That's that's what we all want. Yep. You're like that's kind that of one moment thing. that everybody else already saw. I want to see it. You know, the red the red zone online, channel. The red zone channel from Direct TV was absolutely genius, especially at the height of fantasy sports. Just clicking over to the team that's about to score constantly. That kind of begun for me <laughs> the more uh enjoying like the highlight part of it versus just having to sit back and watch an entire game. Yeah. And you can keep naming sports. I I, I named the biggest ones, but there's other sports that people care about that ESPN has. I I think they are going to make sure that they they protect those rights because those are what's valuable. Sure, I think, sure. I think if they're smart, they would get in on that highlight real stuff and start locking that down too and make that part of this offering as well. I miss bowling. Who has well, bowling? Well, the now? next time uh, you have oh, a yeah. bowling party at your house, Chris, uh, you might uh, have a mess to clean up afterwards. Oh, true. Who bowls in their house? house right switchbot uh has introduced an autonomous vacuum slash mopper called the switchbot s10 if you're saying all right well what does it do it's battery powered uh also has a water station connecting to your in-house plumbing so maybe it would be next to a sink or a washer and dryer that you have in your house so the robot can drain the dirty water and then refill with clean water autonomously that's the idea anyway when the s10 docks with the water tank it also charges the water station's batteries from its own the charging dock uh is sold separately but can also dry a mop as well so it's not necessarily just everything that has to be wet but it that's sort of the selling point um it also empties dust into the charging dock so switchbot says You need to empty the dock's dustbin around every 70 days. And you might say, oh, that's not that often. (laughs) It's kind of often. So it's something that (laughs) you you definitely have to be thinking about uh, as as you're thinking about uh, getting this product. Uh, SwitchBot is also showing off a humidifier that can automatically refill. A dehumidifier, uh, if you live in a humid uh, humid place, uh, that the S10 vacuum could also empty. So there's some options there. Now... You might say, okay, but how much? I'm interested. All these products are going to be showing uh, shown off at IFA in Berlin next week. The event runs from uh, between September 1st through the 5th. Uh, we'll probably get price and availability at that point. The Verge uh, that took a spin with the SwitchBot S10 said, this is probably going to be a upwards of $1,000 or more product. Makes sense. Kind of a big yeah, deal. because yeah, you've got the the battery dock 
which it's not sold separately. It's just separate from the water dock. So they don't have to be next to each other. Ah. And then you have the bot itself, right? So you've got, there's a lot, there's a lot of parts there. It's, it's going to yeah. be pricey. Well, and before the show, both Tom and Chris, you, you were saying like, that just wouldn't work with my laundry room. You it wouldn't either like they're down some stairs or it's just otherwise not accessible. I mean, I think a lot of your home layout will have a lot to do with whether or not this is a great product for you or just something that is expensive and won't work. hundred percent. First off, um, you know, I have been secretly wanting a de- a one of these type of devices for years. I just can't pull the trigger on it it's so expensive and you know <laughs> i'd rather hire a clean lady than you know drop that loot but i want one and eventually i will get one and i love the idea of this thing because it solves a problem right if you have something that's automated the less you have to interact with it the better automation it is but it's just not practical especially in any house that i can think of unless you live like in a rambler or something um <laughs> but uh, my my you know my washing machine and dryer are in my basement it ain't climbing the stairs to come up to the middle floor which is where i mainly want to use it and where my kitchen is also i do want to move my washer and dryer but i don't want to move it to the middle floor i want to move it to the top floor where the bedrooms are so we never have to lug laundry again not you know not going to solve a problem for me there the other thing i'm thinking of is like who whose house layout really is has an option to not only plug in the uh the a, a water spout to it but then you figure drains go down not up so now you need a drain that's actually going downwards unless it has a pump to pump through the drain and then you could probably get way you hook much. it up kind of like you hook up a dishwasher that's that's the way it looks in that kitchen thing. So you're you're plugging it into the drain the way a dishwasher would plug into the drain horizontally, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, but so then it, it has to then it has to sit in front of your sink. They yeah. show a version of a sink where somebody doesn't have a cabinet under the sink, and I'm like, <laughs> how many people? How many people do that? <laughs> uh, and then they show a version with cabinets and the water recharger is sitting in front of the cabinet. And I'm like, that's a non-starter. I'm not going to happen all the time. Exactly. So, I'm with you, man. I, I love this idea of like, Oh, I don't have to ever refill a tank. It just automatically gets the water. But I'd what to do. almost rather go through the trouble of running piping to it where I want it to be rather than trying to jimmy it in by the dishwasher or the sink. hundred percent. If I was to do something like that, I would definitely have to run some plumbing to it. And, uh, you know, and it would not And the spot. It would have in my house, at least I would have to put it. It, w- it wouldn't be an easy run. You know, it's like down in the corner because you want the idea of these things are to be out of the way. Right. When it's not yeah. in use and then it can sneak out, you know, mm-hmm. at night and do its thing. Uh, and then, of course, it has to maneuver itself around my dog as well as the uh, grocery There's bags that, that are under too. the sink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, as a person who I, I I still use my Roomba that I reviewed for Live With It uh, years ago, love that thing. But it also it requires a lot of foresight, right? It's like, how long am I going to be gone? Uh, put some chairs on top of the, you know, coffee table so that, you know, the Roomba can do their thing. You know, you're introducing water into all of this. And then, you, like you said, Chris, it's like, well, my washer dryer in the basement, like, what, what, what am I going to just, you know, d- tear apart my house, you know, for something like this? It all is a great idea in theory for the right yes. layout. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and if you if you're someone who doesn't have cabinets under your kitchen sink, uh, or keep anything else there, <laughs> there's no trash no, can, there's no, no boxes, trash can. no soap. Yeah. No, it's just, it's but yeah, purely, the, the, just nothing. This is Tom, gonna work I've great. never thought of putting anything there. This is gonna work great for you then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, great point. We can build a house around the vacuum. <laughs> And and I do think it's smart that the battery charger and the vacuum are separated. Yep, like it, it goes to the water pump. It charges the water pump so you don't have to keep it charged. There's a lot that's elegant about this. We should we should give it credit for that. Sure. Um the fact that it dries the mop for you at the battery charger station, that's 
there's there's yep. some good stuff in here. It's just Definitely. yeah, we're all we're all getting stuck on like, okay, but how am I really gonna hook this up with a wand? <laughs> My sure. current layout won't support this. I hate and it. And to be yeah. fair, you don't have to hook it up. You can just fill it up on your own. So we should mention that. You as could well. do that. You yeah. Could, exactly. But then that, then it's that, just like I a bunch. Of, there's a bunch of other things that do that. So then I it's think not that's a point. lot of thing. A lot yeah. of things that people don't necessarily get about autonomous cleaning products is like you can do a lot of manual things and this can yeah. still be something that is great for <laughs> your overall, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, cleanliness right. of the house. Yeah. This is just maintenance cleaning, not. Yeah. Maintenance. Yeah. 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 For sure. uh, well, folks, uh, real quickly, I want to remind you that we have a show on our YouTube channel called Top 5, Tom's Top 5, because it's me telling you five things that Roger and I put together every week. This week, surprising projects that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak did that weren't Apple. Uh, we all know they did Apple and they did things together at Apple, but uh, they did things together that were not Apple. Uh, and of course, some things uh, in, independently of each other that are significant as well. And we count down five of them. You can go catch that right now at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. TechCrunch has an article up today discussing the impact of the breach of the MoveIt file transfer software. We have, we have not covered this a lot. We've mentioned it here and there. Uh, the numbers are big. More than 1,000 companies affected at this point, impacting more than 60 million user accounts. Bleeping Computer had an article Wednesday this week focusing on what happened what data was accessed. So we thought uh, we'd take this Friday to kind of give you the, the thousand foot view of what is going on with MoveIt. MoveIt is a corporate file transfer tool from Progress Software. So they provide the tool that lets corporations uh, manage moving files, which, you know, if you're an individual, you're like, why do I need a big tool for that? If you're an enterprise and you got lots of files, this is a good thing. Uh, however, it is managed by Progress Software, which as you'll see, is part of the problem. On June 6th, a ransomware group claimed responsibility for a breach of the tool that had apparently been going on since May. The group said it discovered a vulnerability and was able to access IT environments and sensitive data at companies that used MoveIt. So they weren't doing the ransomware thing where they lock down and encrypt a system. They were doing the ransomware thing where they say, we stole your data and we'll publish it on the internet if you don't pay us. The data appears to be personal info about employees and customers. It's unclear what exactly they have. Obviously, things like email addresses, maybe uh, postal addresses, possibly social security numbers or other government ID numbers. It's hard to tell. The vulnerability itself is what's called a supply chain attack. And this is what I was referring to earlier, that the problem is that it's managed by a company. So what happens in a supply chain attack is you breach the code in the software that's supplied to the clients, and then you can exploit all the clients. You only have to breach once because it's getting supplied to everybody. Uh, for example, in this breach, Zealous is a payroll provider. The attack on MoveIt allowed the attackers to access Zealous, which allowed access to Zealous's customers' payroll info. This particular vulnerability was a zero day as well, meaning it was not previously known. And so it wasn't, oh, people should have patched. Nobody was aware of this until it started being exploited. And it appears the attackers knew about the vulnerability as far back as 2021, but did not exploit it in a noticeable way until this year. It was a SQL injection, if, if you know what that is. Basically, it's a, it's a way to inject data into a database request that then causes unplanned behavior, which can be exploited for the unauthorized access. In this case, the attackers installed a backdoor in MoveIt that let them download data from MoveIt's clients. All right, so we know how it was done. We know what it was. We know it's had a wide impact. Here's my question for the panel. This is a large attack, but I see a lot of hair on fire headlines saying it's the worst attack ever. And I'm not sure how bad it is. I'm not saying it isn't bad, but we don't really know what data is out there. I can't find a clear idea of that. And it does not appear that the attackers have revealed any of the data. So, Chris, I mean, how do we do assess that, this? Do you think that's why it's uh, perceived as perhaps the worst one ever? Because everyone's going, we just don't know. So I think it's the, the uh, well, first of all, we always like to say every breach is the worst one ever because that's a good headline. Right? But, <laughs> right. but, but also it's a large 60 million user counts. That That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think that the headlines are probably over overzealous because they have no idea what was actually 
taken, but that doesn't mean that the headline is incorrect. And so as a guy who professionally works with software, um, you know, this attacks like these have do definitely have reverberating effects. Um, so more and more as we go through and we, you know, we try to sell software to, to companies and stuff like that, we're starting to get questioned more on what is our pen testing uh, plans? What is the re we have to actually share um, the results of those pen tests uh, a lot of times. Uh, what is the scheduling for these? And so you, typically when we started out these type of things, we would do it against certain pieces of software. But now you're, you're going to really have to start testing it against all your software. So imagine now their costs are going up because you need a team that's managing these things and, and then can present this type of information in white papers or whatever to custom to people. And then on top of that, it takes time to run these things. Uh, and then, it, you know, if you're holding up a release because something didn't pass or mm -hmm. you have to come up with a workaround or uh, or basically a time frame as to, OK, this is not as important, but we have to let people know that this exists. So I, I think this is going to as these things continue to happen. Um, you're definitely going to have to, uh, costs are going to go up for people. And then on top of that, you also start to look at it from, this is from a professional standpoint that we're having these questions, but some of these companies like Dropbox or whatever were affected by this too. So now we're talking about consumers and are these guys are now going to have to be expected to start working the chain and understanding, okay, who does this company use for, uh, to provide their services to me because yeah, Dropbox does this, but are they using Azure for storage mm -hmm. and are they doing all these things? And you no, know, there's no way that that's going to happen. So I, I think this definitely has a massive effect and it is, and it's going to be a problem um, because now you start digging into the trust of these organizations and, you know, does this then impact uh, a lot of people's move or trust in cloud operated uh, applications. So this is, this is still pretty big. Yeah, no, that's a good that's a good explanation. That that kind of clears it up for me to think like, okay, it's a red alert. We may not know how deep the red is, <laughs> but it's a red alert. Like even if it's just emails uh, and 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 home and mailing address, uh, the the scope of it is so big that it's going to be costly. And as you pointed out, Sarah, it could be worse. There there could be other things in there that we're unaware of. I do. Wonder how much bluffing is going on since they get, they've passed several deadlines of if you don't pay us by now, we're going to publish it and they haven't published it. So, yeah, I, there, there could be a bit of that. Right. But yeah. but still, even with the threat of the attack. Right. The next thing that comes up is like, how are you guys protecting against this type of attack and what, what are you doing against it? So even if they're bluffing it still makes people have to work a lot more diligently to prepare for the next attack. So in the case that they're not bluffing, you know what I mean? So yeah, it yeah. still has an impact no matter what. Well, Bleeping Computer had a really good article going into the like, you know, you need to move to zero trust. Here are the things you sure. need to do. Um, uh, if if you are in a company situation, uh, go, go check that out. Uh, we have a link to it, or you can just go to ble bleepingcomputer.com. Yeah, definitely more companies are doing that too. All right. Uh, well, I think it is time to see what Len Peralta has been drawing for us today on the show. Len, what's what's at the tip of your pen? Well, you know, one of the great things about working on DTNS is sometimes I get to put two stories together. It's sort of like the Reese's, Reese's uh, peanut butter cup of ah, art. Yeah. So my question is, what if the... Uh, S10, I'm trying to remember the name, the SwitchBot S10, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, mixed with the Move It uh, uh, breach, oh, no. <laughs> what would happen? And I think you got your SwitchBot in my Move It. <laughs> you get this, right. This is uh, the Move It Bot 10, the personal data quicker sucker upper. Oh my and, gosh. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of going around just <laughs> grabbing PIN numbers and passwords and <laughs> bank info and private pics and all that stuff. This is. Absolutely. It is the most trusted bot in exploiting your client's vulnerabilities. 
So Absolute bot. genius. <laughs> Absolute genius. Thank you. The move it a bot. A supply yeah. chain bot sucker that you don't have <laughs> exactly. to recharge. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so if you're into, Perfect. like, if you like these mashups and everything else, and if you want to see, uh, if you want to get this for yourself, you can get it right now at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, where you can, uh, if you are if you back me at the DTNS lover level, you get it right away. Or... You can go to the old-fashioned way. Go to my online store, lenperaltastore.com, where there is not only you can find that piece, but all kinds of other DTNS pieces and other commissionable art as well. So check it out. Um, it's right there for you at your fingertips. Well, Len, we're happy to have you on the show. I missed yes. you the last couple of weeks. I missed you too. Me too. Nice um, to I am very happy to have Chris Ashley on the show as well. Not only because there's an apron for barbecue and tech in his background that I would like to purchase for myself, uh, right. but Chris, let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do because you're a busy guy. I am, but you can always catch me and the homies on SMR Podcast. And today, release season five of Barbecue and Tech, episode Ooh. one, where we did a smoke hey. meatball experiment. Mm. That is meatballs right off my smoker. Mm. They were delicious. And, uh, yeah, we have got some really cool interviews lined up for this season. And, uh, yeah, some really cool experiments and uh, testing some equipment that we're going to be messing around with. So, yeah, come check us out. Awesome. Always a great listen. Uh, I was so happy to have that in my ears this morning. So I'm, I'm very excited. Barbecue and Tech is back. Go check it out, folks. Mm. Uh, patrons of DTNS, stick around. We have more show for you. Good Day Internet begins right now. And it's the premiere on Friday of GDI Debates. Oh, We're going to talk, take on the great questions of the day and debate their merits like boneless wings. Are they just chicken nuggets? That is our first question. Stick around when we debate it next. <laughs> <laughs> just a reminder that DTNS itself is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern at 2000 UTC. We do it Monday through Friday, y'all. We'd love to have you join us live if you can. More information at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. We'll be back on Monday doing it all again. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-hosts, Rob Dunwood and Megan Monroney. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, AKA Gadget Virtuoso, and JD Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Our contributors this week were Justin Robert Young, Shannon Moore, Scott Johnson, and Chris Ashley. And our guests this week were Huen Tui Dao and Charlotte Henry. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>